seconds. In fact, this is something profound to which we've alluded, this idea that you represent the position operator as simple multiplication by x. The momentum operator is the operator minus ih bar d d x. Um, as an aside, you may recall from your Halcyon days of physics 280 and maybe even PCHEM, although I don't know if you this in PCHEM here, but um, there's also a momentum space wave function. You can actually talk about a momentum space wave function psi of P and T instead of psi of X and T. Ah, yeah, you haven't seen this before, huh? That's the difference between physics and chemistry. We full throttle the theory here in physics. The momentum space wave function <coughs> measure the momentum. The momentum space wave function tells you the probability density from momentum. What's the probability of finding the momentum within some small interval around P? That's psi of P and T absolute square dP.
And the expectation value of x is psi star. Here I'm actually writing the variables because of them at all to be at least a halfway decent mathematical citizen. I need to make it explicit which, which uh, space I'm in, momentum space or position space. What do you think the expectation value of x looks like? Well, in position space, the expectation value of p is psi star minus a h bar d dx psi dx. So what do you think it is in momentum space to get the position expectation value? Well, I'll give you one thing. It's not minus i h bar. It turns out to be plus i h bar. Something operating on p, psi of pt, dp. Instead of d dx, it'll be DDP, yeah, DDP. So there's this entirely equivalent formulation of quantum mechanics in terms of momentum space instead of position space. In most problems, the position space version is easier, but there are exceptions to that, as a matter of fact. It's easier to work in momentum space. So in momentum space, the p operator is multiplication by p, and the x operator is taking i h bar times the p derivative of the function. Uh, it's the operator which is i h bar d d p, as opposed to position space, where in position space the x operator is multiplication by x, the p operator is the application of minus i h bar d d x to the wave function. So there's this symmetry, but for the minus sign versus plus sign right here. But that's just because if you remember your Fourier transform theory, you've got the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, one of which has e to the ikx in it, the other which has e to the minus ikx in it. And so same deal when you go from the transform to the inverse Fourier transform, you flip a sign. Variables, and so you have that. So I've gone kind of far afield here, but it's because I can't help myself. This is so cool that I have to mention it now. I mean, you know, really, for me, the first time I learned this, I'm like sitting there floating on air. I thought it was just so great because all these things are tying together. And, and, and guess what? I didn't learn it until grad school. So you're getting a better education than I did. All right. Um, okay, any questions? And in fact, there's a general prescription that if you want to translate a classical problem into its quantum mechanical version, then you take the dynamical quantities that depend on position and momentum and translate them into operator equivalents. So, for example, so that was right there. So, uh, to go from the classical formulation of a problem. functions of p and q p and q, sorry uh, x, x and p I'm just jumping way ahead here <laughs> all of a sudden I'm doing uh, physics 310 classical mechanics, generalized coordinates are called p's and q's typically and, okay, so never mind mind your p's and q's uh, express as functions of calm down the uh, x and p, or if we're in three dimensions, x, y, z, p, x, p, y, p, z. If you're in three dimensions, you've got x, 
x and y and z, and p sub x and p sub y and p sub z. And replace them with their operator versions.
the LZ operator is what I get from making the cross product where I put in x, y, and z, because in position space, x, y, and z are the operators for x, y, and z position. But for momentum, the operator for x, uh, for px, is minus ih bar partial with respect to x. And for py, it's minus ih bar partial with respect to y. So I just implicitly have chunk dimensions. In one dimension, p is operated, uh, p operators minus i h bar ddx. Jump into three dimensions, and you have to look at corresponding variables. So the three momentum operators in, in three dimensions are px is minus i h bar partial with respect to x, py is minus i h bar partial with respect to y, pz is minus i h bar partial with respect to z. So then, if I want to make, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, call me on that there. The vector L operator is that whole determinant. And then I'm going to look at the Z component of that vector. So this determinant expands into three pieces, one for each direction. So if I just want the Z operator, uh, the, the LZ operator by itself, I just, again, get the piece, the, sub, the, the determinant of the piece, which I get by striking out the row and column containing z hat. So I will get a factor of minus ih bar that comes out because it's in every single term, x partial with respect to y minus y partial with respect to x. So this operator represents the z component of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. This operator operates on wave functions in quantum mechanics. This is the operator that represents the z component of angular momentum.
yes, this system has a certain amount of parity factor, but it's unmeasurable, so we don't have to worry about it. That sounds like something like you know, so-called psychics will do, right? You know? Well, psychic power can't be measured. Well, then it's BS, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, if psi represents a system having a definite value of some measurable physical quality, then psi is an eigenfunction of the corresponding operator and the associated eigenvalue is what we are guaranteed to get about as fundamental as it gets when you talk about the essence of quantum mechanics. The idea is that any physical quantity is represented by some operator which acts on the wave function. <coughs> and if the, the quantity in question has a definite value, what that means is that whenever you measure it, you're guaranteed to get the same result. That's what it means in quantum mechanics to say some some variable like angular momentum or energy or whatever has a definite value. What that means is when you measure it, you're always going to get the same result with 100% certainty. Whereas usually, for an arbitrary wave function, every time you make a measurement on the system, you'll get something different. On, you know, you get a bunch of identical systems. Every time you make a measurement, you get some distance. So different. So like a general quantum wave function doesn't have a definite value of position. Every time you measure a system with that wave function, you'll get something different when you talk about the probabilities. But there are special wave functions that do have a definite value of position or energy or angular momentum or whatever. What is the property of those wave functions? It's that they are eigenfunctions of the operator which represents the quantity in question. So, for example, take LZ here. If LZ operator applied to psi gives a simple number, what do I want to call that number? I don't know. I'll call it, I don't know, give me a good name for a simple number. Okay, I'll call it A. <laughs> no, A is usually empty. I'll call it little b, just because I'm making something up. Small L. Okay, well, yeah, I kind of like that. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. How about little l sub z? Then let's, let's call that our randomly chosen name for our simple number here. So lz has to be a number. It can't be a function of x. It can't be a function of p. It can't be anything like that. It's just a number. It's 3h bar, for example. You know, whatever. A number, not a function of anything, just a number. Then psi is an eigenfunction of LZ with eigenvalue, little l sub z. That's what we mean by eigenfunction, eigenvalue. A function is an eigenfunction of an operator. That means that applying the operator in the end, all you get is a multiple of the original function, and that multiple is what we call the eigenvalue. And it's important to realize if I take some arbitrary function and apply L sub z to it, I apply this operator to it, 
I get something which is not just a multiple of the function I started with. It's a very special condition to have a function where I apply this differential operator to it, turn the crank, and out comes the fa function back again times the simple number. That's, that's special. So eigen functions are special. Just like every child is these days. Every child is special and above average and, and all that. But um, anyway, um, that's this that's that's what you know it's, it's uh, you can't emphasize enough how important that is in quantum mechanics, is that every physical quantity is represented by an operator, and only if the system's wave function is an eigenfunction of that operator is that physical quantity always going to be the same every time you measure it. And in that case, the value you're going to get when you make the measurement is the corresponding eigenvalue of the operator. Do you remember, it turns out, as we'll show later, what are the eigenvalues for L sub z? What are the possible orbital angular momenta in quantum mechanics? Multiples of... That's for, well, that, 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 that works for spin. For, you, know, you can have spin angular momenta where it's, mul where it's, where it's where there's paths in there. But if it's orbital angular momentum, it's an integer multiple of h bar. Yeah, it turns out, as we'll show later, uh, but you've seen before, derived with waving chicken feet, that the eigenvalues of LZ turn out to be integer multiples of h bar. We're not, we're not anywhere near showing that right now, but it turns out that inter, integer multiples of h bar are the eigenvalues of this operator. And it's inter, integer multiples of h bar because h bar is in the operator's definition, and the physics comes in with the presence of h bar right there. That's something that's saying, and in the real universe, it's multiples of h bar. Whereas, you know, uh, you could build your own universe where you made h bar equal like the real universe doesn't have that freedom somehow. Why is H bar? Why does H bar have the value it does? You should be looking at me like I'm crazy right now because well, who knows? You know we don't know why H bar has the value it does, um, but it does. You know we just say what we can say what it has, but not why it has. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> speaking of which, I'm, I'm just going to jump ahead and, and tell you my favorite problem in your book here. Let me see. Uh, so, find structure constant, page 267. Shows up when you're solving a hydrogen atom, throwing in uh, relativistic and other corrections and so forth. Uh, let's see. So, problem 6.11, the find structure constant is. Alpha, which is equal to e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught h bar c. So notice it's got the charge on the electron and h bar and c. You know, you got relativity, electromagnetism, which is, well, relativity and electromagnetism are awfully intimately related to one another. h bar, quantum mechanics is thrown in there. There's epsilon naught, there's, there's electromagnetism again. That turns out to be equal to 1 over 137.036 something something. So about 1 over 137. It's this fundamental property of the universe that 1 over 137 point something is this really fundamental number. When you do Feynman diagrams for quantum electrodynamics, each vertex basically represents the power of the fine structure constant in a perturbation series. And it's the fact that the fine structure constants is about 1 over 137 that it behaves reasonably. In the strong force, the equivalent thing isn't 1 over 137. It's a big number, which is why quantum chromodynamics partly is much harder than quantum electrodynamics, because you're trying to make a series of big numbers instead of small numbers. And the series of big numbers have hard times converging, even harder than the series of small numbers do. Anyway, problem 611 says, Calculate the fine structure constant from first principles, i.e., without recourse to the empirical values, 
of epsilon naught, E, H bar, and C. Comment. The fine structure constant is undoubtedly the most fundamental pure dimensionless number in all of physics. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. I didn't put units there because there aren't units. It really is 1 over 137 point something. It's a dimensionless quantity. Doesn't matter what system of units you get, you're going to get the same result. It relates the basic constants of electromagnetism, the charge of the electron, relativity, and speed of light, and quantum mechanics, Planck's constant. If you can solve part B, the part that I just read you, you have the most certain Nobel Prize in history waiting for you. But I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of time on it right now. Many spark people have tried and all so far have failed. But if you can solve that problem, I want your autograph. And I want an invitation to the ceremony where they award you the Nobel Prize and where you become at least as famous as Einstein in the hearts of physicists and maybe beyond. So, so there's your task. Derive that from first principles, you know, not by plugging in the numbers, and, and, and I will worship you. <laughs> Lots of people have tried to do it. The, the greatest minds have failed upon trying to come up with this in first principles. Um, so good luck with that. On the other hand, there is an actual case. You go to Snopes.com, you can read about it, or even Legends website, um, where a math professor wrote an unproved theorem on the board, a famous unproved conjecture. A grad student came into class late, wrote it down thinking it was a homework assignment, and solved it. <laughs> and actually, you know, it was verified that this graduate student had actually proved this unproved conjecture. So the, the author probably shouldn't have said all that. He probably should have just, you know, here, here's your homework problem. And some student somewhere would come back and have a solution, and then the professor would be like, Oh my! You know, and then just kind of go from there. Uh, but, sorry, I've like, blown it and, and pointed out that you know, it's, it's, uh, you're not going to do any other homework if you spend all your time on that one. <laughs> yeah. Plus, you really should take quantum field theory first, you know, and all that sort of thing. But, um, so, anyway. Um, the, you know, we've, we've done the angular momentum there uh, as an example, but there's something that is even more elementary that we can apply this to, namely the expression for the Hamiltonian. Should be the quantum mechanical version of the energy operator. 
for the system, and it is. So the quantum Hamiltonian is going to be, well, let's see, the P operator in quantum mechanics is represented by minus I H bar by dx. So there's p squared over 2m quantum mechanical version, because that's the p operator squared. So this is just this piece is just p operator squared over 2m. And then since x is just x in momentum I mean if in position space at least, since x is just x, v of x represents the operator for the potential energy, again. So there is the Hamiltonian operator in, in, in quantum mechanics. H as an operator is then, writing it out, it's minus h bar squared over 2m, second partial with respect to x as an operator, it's still waiting for a psi to smack around, plus v of x. Why, there you go. And notice that now, if we go back to the Schrodinger equation, that was I h bar d psi dt, d psi dt is minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi dx squared plus v of x psi of x. That was the Schrodinger equation. Oh, look at that. In other words, the Schrodinger equation is <coughs> I h bar d psi dt is equal to the Hamiltonian operator applied to psi. So the Schrodinger equation is really just, really just, quote unquote, uh, the expression I h bar d psi dt is the energy operator applied to psi. p squared over 2m plus v of x multiplying quote unquote psi. When you multiply an operator by a function, it needs to apply it to the function. So the Schrodinger equation doesn't just come out of nowhere from on high. It has a physical interpretation. The thing applied to psi is the Hamiltonian operator, uh, which you take from classical mechanics and write in quantum form by replacing P with minus I h bar ddx. And um, so this suggests that IH bar DDT represents the energy operator, and in fact, that's true. And furthermore, it suggests, and it's true, that if you want a wave function, to have a definite value of the energy, it needs to be an eigenfunction of h, or of i h bar dt. It is that too, as we'll see when we look in general. You get a, a wave function where if you have a, where if in one dimension you can separate variables, and the wave functions have the form of a function of x times e to the minus i e t over h bar. And you take the time derivative, you get e out in front, when you apply the space derivatives in h and plus e of x, you also get e multiplying, you get an eigenfunction. So, in other words, the point is that we're going to uh, next time take up uh, where you want to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation. And when you do that, you find 
that what you're looking for are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator, <coughs> and those eigenfunctions are the wave functions which have definite values of the energy, and the eigenvalues are those definite values of the energy. So we have a situation where you've got a classical operator promoted to a quantum operator, and its eigenfunctions are the, are the wave functions that have definite values of the energy. And you know, this sort of suggests the question of we're, we're, we're getting to the quantum problem by taking the classical problem and promoting everything to operators. Now, if you take the long view, um, are Newton's laws true? Is classical mechanics true in some sense? Well, no, right? Because do real particles have definite positions and momenta and obey Newton's second law and all that? No, because as far as we can tell, the experiments say that the real world is not described by Newton's laws. The real world is not described by little particles that have definite positions and momenta. The real world is described instead by quantum mechanics. And so maybe super intelligent beings would never discover quote unquote Newton's laws because they're not even right to begin with. So it's not written that you must find Newton's laws before you find the laws of quantum mechanics. So it's at least conceivable it's hard for me to believe it would actually happen, but in principle, you could have some, some intelligent species out there where they did experiments on subatomic scales first and deduced the laws of quantum mechanics from them, and then some genius in their species came along and showed that there's a limit where you can pretend that things are these little points that have definite positions and momenta and obey these simplified approximations that are called Zippelflan's rules of thumb. And Zippelflan's rules of thumb turn out to be Newton's laws of mechanics because, you know, fundamentally, as far as we know, the world is quantum mechanical, and classical mechanics is just this approximation in some limit of quantum mechanics. And yet, conceptually, we usually start with the classical problem and then promote it to the quantum problem. But I just want to point out that really, the quantum problem is what's there, and then you can make this classical approximation by pretending, ha ha ha, that this thing that's really represented by applying minus a h bar ddx, you can pretend that there's this quantity p that's got a definite value associated with it. And in the right limit, it behaves like it does. Isn't that weird? I mean, our intuition is built on wave packets and so forth, but there are actually creatures out there who think in terms of like things having definite positions and momentum. We didn't evolve to think that way here on Zorkon, but we met these creatures called humans. They're pretty primitive, but they actually think in terms that they call tables and chairs and so forth. And, and these things have these weird behaviors. I mean, they live on this scale where they walk through doors and, and they can't even notice they're diffracting through them, for example. It's bizarre, you know. So, something to think about. Uh, occupy your weekend with it. It's time to go. There you go, very good. <laughs> Alex says hi, Alex. <laughs>